only one Lord is worthy of your life. If Christians have any doubt about who they belong to, we hear in Paul's letter to the Romans, we belong to the Lord. Do we speak with similar clarity today? I'll be reading from the 1970 New American Version. Let's ready ourselves to receive the Word of God. Paul writes, None of us lives as our own master, and none of us dies as our own master. While we live, we are responsible to the Lord. And when we die, we die as his servants, both in life and in death. We are the Lord's. That is why Christ died and came to life again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Weekly, if not daily, we strive to understand what this belonging means. Many of us have grown up with this word, Lord, in our religious and spiritual vocabularies. Yet the term Lord was contested back in the times of early church. Calling anyone other than Caesar Lord could land you in the arena amid hungry lions. Lord was Caesar's preferred title, along with Son of God. Caesar was the center of the Roman universe. Many were beholden to the powers of empire, but Paul isn't writing about them. Rather, he says, while we live, we are responsible to the Lord, as in Christ Jesus condemned and crucified by Caesar's men, and raised to life by the hand of God. Here we find an entirely new culture emerging in the shell of the old and crumbling. Paul is telling us with this new way of living, expect to not fit in with the all-enveloping and all-consuming culture of greed, acquisition, exclusion, and domination. You will look like oddballs. You may even appear to be outlaws to the culture you are expected to conform to and support with a good consumer's appetite for more and your frequent use of those loyalty cards that promise more points for purchasing more stuff you don't need, but you buy anyway, all financed, of course, by institutions deemed too big to fail. Paul is speaking of the Christ-centered life, the one Lord who alone is worthy of our lives. Paul is writing about our necessary foundational allegiance lived out in the day to day. It's not about who I say I give my life to, but who I actually give my life to. So we hear a creedal statement here, a profession of allegiance to the one Lord. Well, <laughs> there was a time in my mid-twenties when I was startled to discover that I had gravitated toward a different Lord in my life. I was working as a secretary in a law office. I liked my work, and I was putting together my young adult life in San Francisco. Wow, the city. Suddenly I felt cosmopolitan. My life's options were opening up. One thing I noticed about life in the city was that the liquor flowed. Hard liquor was not my thing. 
but I began to imagine that nice, quietly sophisticated way to relax after a day at work was to pour myself a little glass of something smooth, turn on some jazz or some classical music, sit on my white wicker chair at the bay window overlooking downtown, take in the skyline, and feel grown up. Well, after a couple of weeks of this, I began to notice mid-afternoon that I was starting to think about that drink. Two hours I'd sigh, and I'd force my mind to concentrate on my work. That drink was becoming my afternoon motivator. This rattled me. So that Saturday, I took that bottle of booze, put it in a paper bag, got on the Geary bus, and went straight out to the ocean. I mean straight out. I rolled up my jeans, pulled off my shoes and socks, waded into the tide with that bottle in hand, and I emptied it. Immediately, the ritual made me feel clean. Sneaky Lord Liquor had no more sway in my life. I was free to live centered again in the presence of the one Lord with a pure and joyful heart. Truth be told, we have all kinds of Lords in our lives. I remember the Reverend Jim Wallace saying that a credit card statement is a moral document or at least a sobering testament to all the things I value with my money. Paul understood, and we strive to understand, that Caesar's power, King Mammon's power, Empire's power, is no match for the power that flows from Jesus' resurrection. Every morning I think deeply about this invisible power, invisible, that is, until we find it present everywhere, penetrating into the most needful places. I give you this phrase now, the power that flows from Jesus' resurrection. It's an elemental, inexhaustible, life-giving, sovereign power, unmatched by the powers of this world. Caesar can't go there. He amasses power, riches, glory, and honor to himself. Jesus bestows power, pours it forth, the inexhaustible power of the Spirit of the risen Christ. He breathes it forth, gives it away. The most attractive thing about Jesus was his wise, compassionate, outward-facing way of being among others. He didn't use others. He brought them to life. Caesar can't do that. King Mammon can't do that. The Christ-centered life finds purpose, not in a political party or ideology, not in what's trending now, but in a person, Jesus, crucified Lord and risen Christ. The early church's creedal statement is a very bold counterstatement to what empire would have us understand. The Christ-centered community professes to live by a different standard. The measure of its utterly nonviolent power is in the ways we bring justice, compassion, healing, and peace to a ravaged and traumatized world. Here's where Jesus always was and continues to be found among the broken ones, and the ones who do the breaking. Not to judge them, but to love them, to listen to them, and yes, even to challenge them, to call them into their authentic humanity. In this passage from Paul, we hear something more. The language of slave to master, the one to whom we are responsible, This language does not sit easily with us, because in human history, the relationship of master to slave has tragically been one of violence, a history of power over, of diminishment 
of the personhood of one for the other's transactional gain. The Judeo-Christian liberation story comes alive in powerful ways among those who live enslaved, as the American experience has shown. Liberation theology, which emerged in the exploited and impoverished Southern Hemisphere in the 20th century, reveals God in the person of the crucified Lord and risen Christ, setting free interiorly those who live lives of unimaginable oppression, vulnerability, and unfreedom, all of it human-caused, and intentionally baked into the system. Slavery, in its many dehumanizing forms, is abhorrent to us because we know, or at least deeply intuit, that the human person, each human person, holds inherent dignity and worth that has nothing to do with power transactions, all for someone else's financial gain. None of us lives as our own master, Paul reminds us, nor do we die as our own master. We are responsible, Paul says, not to a slave owner, but to the incomparably worthy Lord who walked the path before us and who desires our fullness of life and our embrace of the title Beloved, which is the only way he sees us. Jesus shared many parables about servants and about the master. Sometimes the transactional, profit-seeking type, and sometimes the master known for his own servant-heartedness. In following the servant-hearted Lord, we might feel most at home at the margins, where the poor, the meek, the pure of heart, the prophets, and other righteous and not-so-righteous oddballs live. Our happiness lies elsewhere. We may not be able to explain it. The Christ-centered life will also cost you something. It may cost you a more secure and lucrative career. It may cost you your reputation or a comfortable lifestyle or a life shaped by convenience. All of that may lie outside your reach and, frankly, outside your appetite. This way of life will also give you something. It will give you a life of lived faith that springs only from the experience of precarity, a life removed from the death grip of a brutally financialized world. Life in the Lord gives you a conscience freed from empire's co-opting allegiance, a life of strong fellowship in beloved community, a life dialed down from empire's demands, a life free to be free in Jesus, the risen Christ, Lord of those who live in him and who die in him. Only one Lord is worthy of your allegiance. Only one Lord is worthy of your life. So here is a question for you. When in my life have I fallen into the lure of a better life in the heart of empire or under the sway of King Mammon? What story comes to mind and how does it end? What story can I share? Only one Lord is worthy of your life. Be well, live in peace, love one another.